questions and we'll get answers back to you as quickly as possible. So today we welcome Wally P and Britt S from Tucson, Arizona. Tonight or today, they're going to chat with us about listening to the God consciousness within. Another way of saying that is that um, it's overcoming addiction through the practice of two-way prayer. And what I, I want to read to you what Patrick has written for us to un, all understand. Uh, in today's workshop, Wally and Britt will present the history and evolution of the 11th step, prayer and meditation, including the Oxford Group and other fellowships, the How to Listen to God pamphlet written by John Batterson, a friend of Dr. Bob's, the 11th step as written in the big book, and the rewrite of the Batterson pamphlet, Listening to God, to the God Consciousness Within by Wally. And so I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I can't wait. And I'll be taking notes. And please take it away, Wally and Britt. All right. Okay. We'll, give you one, we'll give me one moment to uh, share my screen with all of you and okay. get our PowerPoints up. All right. There we go. All right. Go ahead, Wally. Are we ready? Yay! Let's do it. Welcome to our presentation of Listening to the God Consciousness Within. During the next hour and a half, you will learn how to practice step 11 as it was practiced during the early days of the 12 step community. My name is Wally P, and I'm a member of the 12 step community. And my name is Bridis, and I am also a member of a couple of 12 step communities. We want to thank the uh, Friendly Circle Berlin Recovery Group for hosting this workshop. We are honored to be presenting one of our favorite workshops, How to Practice Two-Way Prayer. Prayer is communicating with the one who has all power, and meditation is listening for the answers, directions, and guidance from, quote unquote, for the big book, all powerful guiding creative intelligence that resides inside each and every one of us, whether we believe in this inner power or not. In total, we conduct more than 14 Zoom workshops. If you'd like a list of them, please send your name and email address to wallypattheriver.com. And that'll be uh, somewhere in a chat box. Yeah, I'm gonna, Wally, I'm gonna put it in the chat box when we're finished so everybody can write it oh, down. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm the one who answers the email, even though it says Wally P. So just shoot me an email for that. Okay, now we'll provide you with some additional information as to who we are. I am a long-term member of several 12-step communities. I've been in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction for 34 years. I've also been recovered from food addiction for 32 years and sex addiction addiction for 31 years. In 1992, I was elected to the position of area archivist for the state of Arizona. In 1994, I was elected to the National Archives Study Committee reporting to the General Service Office in New York City. In 1999, I became the caretaker of the personal archives of Dr. Bob and Ann Smith. What an honor that is. Wow. I've written four recovery books and produced numerous CDs and DVDs, as well as Zoom seminars for which I received no income. This is my 12-step work for which I cannot be paid. I'm also an unpaid volunteer at the Back to Basics Foundation. <laughs> yes, you are. Hi, everybody. My name is Bridis. I am, like I said, a long-term member of the original 12-step community with 34 years of recovery. I'm also a member of a couple of others uh, for more than 25 years now. I have been a taper for conventions, workshops, roundups, et cetera. I also do remastering of the old recordings, wire to wire reels, et cetera. I've been a back to basics presenter since 2017. And according to Wally, I'm the technical wizard that will be running the Zoom room for the next half an hour. I also serve as the executive director of the Back to Basics Foundation. And um, I have also been um, 
an archivist at varying uh, groups and districts around the country and overseas. Okay. In much of the historical material we'll be presenting, the authors use the word God, G-O-D. I want you to know that many of us interpret the God word as, quote unquote, the God of our understanding. Or as Bill W. wrote in the big book, the God consciousness within, quote from the book, and the one who has all power, quote from the book, among others. You can also substitute a word that you believe in or feel comfortable with for the God word each time you see or hear it. Please keep in mind that this is a spiritual presentation, not a religious one. In 2015, I wrote a modern gender neutral version of the 1940s beginners meetings that produced a 50 to 75% recovery rate during AA's early days. I modified the format so that it applies to anyone and everyone interested in a spiritual way of life. This is the format we'll use for this seminar, modern, gender neutral, uh, and all inclusive. In 2022, I did a one hour podcast on step 11 with Father Bill W, who lives in Austin, Texas. Uh, the YouTube uh, is at the bottom of this page. We can also put that in the chat room if you're interested. Uh, great, great presentation. We have been good friends for more than 20 years. In terms of my personal journey, I didn't really understand the significance and power of Step 11 until March of 1996. I was seven years sober at the time. I was conducting my first weekend seminar at the Wilson House in East Dorset, Vermont, the home where Bill was born on November 26, 1895. A couple of weeks before the seminar, I talked with James H. over the phone. James's sobriety date uh, was December 12, 1934, one day after Bill W. He was there when the big book was written, and he had firsthand knowledge about the original program of recovery. I invited him to join me at the Wilson House, and he agreed to be my co-presenter. At the time, uh, James was 90 years old and living in the Baltimore, Maryland area. 90 years old. He drove to the Wilson House, uh, about an eight to nine hour drive, and arrived within 10 minutes of anticipated arrival. He bounded out of his car, up the steps, and changed everyone's life, including my own. James brought copies of the How to Listen to God pamphlet that was given to him by the author John Batterson in 1938. John lived in Columbus, Ohio, and was a guest speaker at a weekend seminar in Baltimore that James was also attending. James asked all of us to read and study the pamphlet. And on Sunday morning, he conducted an 11-step guidance meeting based on this four-page pamphlet. I later learned that the format he used was identical to the format used by Ian Smith, Dr. Bob's wife in Akron, Ohio. The title of the seminar was The Greatest Spiritual Movement of the 20th Century. The entire weekend was recorded, including James's Friday night lead and the Sunday morning history of the 11th step guidance meeting. We do sell uh, this eight CD uh, at the Back to Basics Foundation. James traveled with me for the next 10 years as part of my Back to Basics seminars. He was such an inspiration uh, in my life that in the year 2000, I wrote a book based on my travels with James and how the steps were taken before the big book was written. Uh, part of this may be re released as before the basics, how uh, Bill W., Dr. Bob, the person who heard, took the steps before the big book was written. That's the middle seven chapters of the How to List to God book. And, and just, just a little side note about James. He, was, uh, he died in 2006 at 100 years of age. 
and 71 years of sobriety, which I find inspiring and uh, hope to achieve that goal. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody, who somebody, came in somebody early. yeah, somebody like me who came in in their teens or 20s yeah. um, will, will reach that and surpass it, I'm sure, someday. Okay, now let's look at the history of the 11th step. We're going to start with a book written in the late 1600s titled The Practice of the Presence of God. This book was required reading for the early members of AA uh, in both uh, Akron, Cleveland, and New York, among other cities. The book is based on a series of letters Brother Lawrence wrote and conversations he had while living in a Carmelite monastery in France. Brother Lawrence was a French commoner who, at the age of 18, had a conversion experience. Later, in 1649, he became a member of the Carmelite community. He spent much of his time working in the kitchen and thus became known as the monk of the pots and pans. He spent much of his time in the kitchen preparing meals and washing the dishes for the rest of the brothers. And uh, we have a schematic uh, that represents Brother Lawrence uh, uh, preparing uh, the food for the other brothers and later washing all of their dishes. Brother Lawrence says one desire was to commune with God, which he did for his entire life. He provided the world with a gift of a way of life available to anyone who seeks to know God's peace and presence, that anyone, regardless of age or circumstance, can practice anywhere and at any time. Brother Lawrence stated that what he did, everyone can do. The person did not need any special theological training or knowledge to practice the presence of God. Now, again, uh, the book is actually based on uh, letters that he wrote to a friend of his uh, outside the uh, Carmelite community uh, and were published uh, uh, upon Brother Lawrence's passing. A very short uh, book, uh, but extremely powerful. Now, these are some of the revolutionary statements Brother Lawrence made. Remember, he made these statements in the 17th century. Number one. We should establish ourselves in God's presence by continually conversing with God. Here, Brother Lawrence is talking about two-way prayer, AA's 11th step, which consists of prayer and meditation. Number, Number two, two. We should give ourselves up to God and seek our satisfaction only by fulfilling God's will. The big book authors wrote, Thy will, not mine, be done on page 85, paragraph one. Number three. You must first seek God with some diligence, but after little care, we will find we can do it without any difficulty. The big book authors wrote, what used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind, page 87. Number four. We ought to act with God in the greatest simplicity, speaking to God frankly and plainly and asking God's assistance in our affairs. This statement exemplifies AA's keep it simple philosophy. Number five. We ought to, we ought to once and for all heartedly put our whole trust in God and make a total surrender of ourselves to God, knowing that God will not deceive us. This is a summation of AA's surrender steps one, two, and three. And number six. Let us seek him often by faith. He, seek, he is within us. Seek him not elsewhere. The big again, this is a very, very important uh, piece of information. We're talking about, as Bill wrote, the God consciousness within. The big book authors wrote, we found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that one, the one who has all power may be found. Page 55, paragraph three. Now, another book uh, 
uh, that has to do with the Oxford Group. We want to read a passage from it. Uh, it's titled, The Oxford Group, Its History and Significance. Many books have been written about the Oxford Group, the fellowship from which AA evolved. Please keep in mind that Bill W., Dr. Bob, James H., and many of the first 100 were members of the Oxford Group. So one of the quotes on guidance and quiet time reads as follows. A concept equal in importance to the changed life is that of guidance. So far as the Oxford group has any central teaching, it is that God will give us will give guidance to those who listen for it with the sincere intent to put it into practice. Neither Buckman, the leader of the Oxford group, nor the group members will maintain that the that they originated the concept, but every member will emphasize its importance. Everyone can listen to God. The only sane people in an insane world are those guided by God. Definite direction and accurate information can still come from the mind of God to the mind of the listener. Another book that uh, was instrumental, uh, What is the Oxford Group? It was written anonymously in 1933 and was considered to be the Oxford Group's big book. The middle eight chapters uh, deal with the four standards of honesty, purity, and selfishness and love, which are equivalent to the first four assets on the ACE four-step assets and liabilities checklist and the four steps or spiritual activities, which are surrender, steps one, two, and three, sharing steps four, five, six, and seven, amends steps eight and nine, and guidance steps 10, 11, and 12. So whether you take the four steps out of what is the Oxford group or the 12 steps uh, from the AA Big Book, it is basically the same process. Now, there is a quote on quiet time that is quite important, and it reads, it is necessary in our quiet time to give our mind to God free of doubts and distractions. We must be convinced that God can and will tell us what is best for us to do or not to do in the plan of our daily lives or in any problem that confronts us. Another book that was required reading for the early A's was When Man Listens by Cecil Rhodes. An original copy of this book would probably cost more than $500. We're very fortunate that Tushi Palmieri, a good friend of mine, has reproduced many of these early books. On Amazon, you can buy Tushi's reprint of When Man Listens for less than $15. So $500 uh, as an original, $15 for a reprint. Uh, I'll take the reprint, <laughs> although we have the original. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Uh, when Man Listens has often been referred to as a simple version of the Alcoholics Anonymous book. Go ahead and finish that up, Britt. I'm sorry, you lost me. Uh, read what's on the right side. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we practiced this yesterday. I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> when a man listens has often been referred to as the simple version of the Alcoholics Anonymous book. It is a life altering book that transforms a person's relationship with God. This, is, this new empowering relationship then alters every aspect of the person's life. Problems get resolved and difficulties disappear. This epic making book has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people over the last century. Although written almost a century ago, the words ring true today as though they were written for those of us living in the 21st century. Although the book is Christian-based, its teachings and principles apply equally to all faiths. This is a must-read for anyone in a recovery program and for others who desire to change their lives for the better. Uh, here is one of Cecil Rose's quotations having to do with quiet time. This does not mean that when we have a quiet time, we resign our reasoning powers. The idea that listening to God means making your mind a blank 
is a curious misconception that has hindered many people. It does mean that you leave room for God to lead you beyond your human thoughts and tell you things you could never know yourself. Now back to the Oxford Group book, uh, another quote that uh, was considered to be a uh, cornerstone of the Oxford Group steps. The group advocates our use of pencil and a notebook so that we can record every God-given thought and idea that comes to us during our time alone with God, that no detail, however small, may be lost on us, and that we may not shirk the truth about ourselves or any problem when it comes to us. And I want to add to that, not only is it a thought that comes to us or anything like that, but also a sensation, um, because you will find when, as you do this, you can have the sensation of smell, um, among other sensations, but uh, hearing, hearing things that are not necessarily in the room, uh, that has happened. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Okay, thank you, Britt. Next, we're going to talk about steps on the stairway to recovery. This is an extremely rare pamphlet written in the 1920s on the quiet time. I was able to make a copy of this pamphlet, which was in the Sam Shoemaker section of the National Archives of the Episcopal Church in Austin, Texas. In the 1930s, Sam Shoemaker was the leader of the Oxford Group in the United States. It took me two years to get one day in these archives. The visit had to be in conjunction with one of my seminars in Austin, and it had to be on a Friday. The archival committee only met twice a year to decide who they were going to let in. In addition, I had to have two letters of referral from members of the Episcopal Church. Father Bill W., the man I did the podcast with recently, was one of them. And just a second, I might have a, oh. I think we're going to have a puppy outside. Sorry. One of, the, one, of the, one of the many gatekeepers, one of six actually gatekeepers we have here at the office. Yeah. Puppies. Puppies. All right. <laughs> I was able to make a copy of this pamphlet, which was in the Sam Shoemaker section of the National Archives of the Episcopal Church. In the 1930s, as I mentioned, Sam was a leader of the Oxford Group in the United States. Even though the pamphlet didn't identify an author, I personally believe it was written by Sam Shoemaker. Personal uh, opinion. It was in one of the file folders identifying the material in Sam's desk at the Calvary Church in New York City. Sam was the minister there during the period of time the Big Book was written. Bill W. conducted much of his research for the Big Book in Sam's office because Sam had all the Oxford Group books on the shelves. Uh, I used 14 of them to uh, uh, write the How to Listen to God book. Uh, uh, it was at least 25 to 30 books in total from that period of time. And Bill had access to all of them. Steps on the Stairway to Recovery describes a six-step program that includes surrender, four standards of honesty, purity, and selfishness and love, sharing, keeping the quiet time, obeying guidance, and helping others. We'll now read one of the quotations on quiet time uh, from this pamphlet. Yeah, I do have some quotations here. The most difficult thing in the world is to listen, but it is the most productive. The quiet time emphasizes all of these elements, petition, realization, and listening. That is on the, in the stair steps or steps on the stairway, page one. Another quote, quote number two. The quiet time has a, geni a genius all of its own. It brings us to a closer relationship with God within ourselves. 
It is a consequence of surrender. If we surrender our own will, we instinctively listen to God's will. And we cannot get God's guidance until we, resent, we surrender our own ego. Life is very complex. Someone has said life is very easy until we begin to live it. We need much guidance. God provides it to us in the quiet time. As we need much guidance, we need much time to listen. Our guidance will be in proportion to the length of time and purity of our time alone with God. Steps on the story, page one and two. Sorry, uh, uh, just caught that. Uh, uh, it's on the uh, uh, first uh, sentence in this paragraph. It brings us to a closer relationship with God within ourselves. God consciousness within is how Bill wrote it in the big book, but basically the same concept. Uh, slide number three, or quote, uh, quiet time, quote number three. Who's lost in the slides now? Oh, goodness. The quiet time, how to get guidance in quiet time. Assume a comfortable position. I personally like to sit on the floor. Two, enter it with an attitude of real expectancy. Three, insist that the revealing shall come. Four, maintain an attitude of reverence, love, and humility. Steps on the stairway, page two. The secret of an enlarged and sure guidance lies in obeying all guidance that you get. How to distinguish between thoughts that come from personal desire or the lesser self and those that are from God pass each one through the fourfold test of the four standards. Steps on the stairway, page two. The four standards are honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, which became the first four assets in the big book, step four inventory. And I'm going to tell you if you don't listen to the guidance that you get, get ready for the proverbial two by four between the eyes because you will get it or at least that's my experience. And I will explain that later on in the workshop. Hey, quote number five. God will never guide you to do anything that is not honest, pure, unselfish, and loving. It is a great help to keep quiet, keep the quiet time with others in addition to your own quiet time, and then check your guidance with, you, with them. Steps on the stairway, page two. This concept evolved into AA 11 step guidance meetings. Which we and I read more about at the end of the session. Exactly. And one thing I'll say about that is uh, Daddy Jim, James H., um, he, uh, he believed in that if you had a significant other or a spouse, that you do a guidance time or have them as a sharing partner as well. And uh, we find that very beneficial. Yes, uh, next we have The Guidance of God by Eleanor Ford, written in 1930. In 1930, Eleanor Ford wrote a book titled The Guidance of God. She was the secretary at the Calvary Church in New York City, which again was the U.S. headquarters for the Oxford Group. She was heaven, heavily involved with the group, and this book was her contribution to the fellowship. In the early 1940s, she married Jim Newton, who was one of the people who helped found Alcoholics Anonymous in Akron, Ohio. I've written a seminar titled The Four Founding Moments of AA from the Akron Perspective. Uh, to date, I'm the only one that makes this presentation. And Jim Newton is an important part of the first three of these four founding moments. Here are some of Eleanor's quotes on practicing the presence. Quote one. We now turn to think of God's presence in the quiet time. We take for granted the fact that God is always with us. One has put uh, but to read the inspiring members, memoirs of Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence of God over his pots and pans to realize this, that God can communicate with us walking along the street or seeing that we are in a given place at the right moment 
goes without saying. Guidance of God, page 23. Oh, number two. The reason why the quiet time is of supreme importance is that we can shut out the world with its clamor of duty, its conflicting appeals, and our own tangled thoughts and realize the presence of God. Quote number three. We need enough time to forget, and this often means the sacrifice of other interests and most inevitably the last precious hour of the morning sleep. It is not too much to say that for many people, the success of the whole day completely depends on that first hour along with God. And those who would move mountains must have given God their ear before the rush of life is upon them. For many, it may involve the discipline of getting, of getting earlier to bed. Remember the, that no real duties in life conflict and you can let God order your day so that everything that is God's will for that day will be done. Quote number four. Guidance comes in action. If your life is caught up in God's purpose to redeem the world, it may matter seriously what street you take which train you go by, and what time you make an appointment. God's will is a mosaic, that it is. The thought may come that there is some new line of personal discipline to be taken up, a relationship to be put right. Promises are given, which later we have the joy of seeing come true. There will be, if one's ear is sensitive, warnings that temptation is about, and like Noah, we may be warned of things not yet seen. It has been a habit for many people to keep a small notebook of recording these thoughts. And again, in keeping with the notebook to record these thoughts, uh, I have numerous ones uh, that I have uh, compiled uh, since 1996 uh, when I met James and started uh, to practice two-way prayer the way it was practiced during the early days. Uh, we also have uh, a gift, not a gift, but uh, on loan, there's the right yes. word, uh, from uh, James Hauk III, Jimmy Tree, yes. uh, Jimmy Tree. and uh, we're, in the present, we're in the process of uh, uh, copying uh, his entire guidance book from this period of time. Well, not copying, but scanning it in so we have his actual writing, um, but it's mostly done in pencil, so it takes a little bit to get it scanned in where you can read it. But we are going to do that and uh, uh, yes. maybe releasing it to the public if uh, anybody wants to see how this was done uh, by James uh, during this period of time. Yeah, it is truly an honor to, to uh, be able to have that in our presence and look through it. Yeah, here it is. Yay! James yep. And again, James was responsible for passing the on the How to Listen to God pamphlet to me. Uh, and between the two of us, uh, we passed out more than a half a million of these uh, at conferences, conventions, and workshops. I still get requests weekly, and I imagine I will after this workshop, get many um, requests for the pamphlet as well. But Without fail, probably about weekly, I get at least one, if not more, requests. It is the clearest and cleanest explanation for the second half of step 11 that I have ever read and put into practice. Yes. In the 1930s, John Batterson, who was the author of the pamphlet, lived in Columbus, Ohio. In the late 1990s, I conducted five days of research on the Benjamin Forbes archives housed at Ohio Wesleyan University, which was just north of Columbus. Again, five days of research. Uh, James Forbes was a prominent member of the Oxford Group who had donated 16 boxes of archives to Ohio Wesleyan. Again, those boxes had never been opened uh, from the 1970s when they were donated to the late 1990s 
when I was the first person to actually open the boxes and copy much of the 16 pages, uh, uh, 16 boxes. Uh, again, I have over 100,000 pages of archival uh, materials uh, in our personal archives, and a good bit of it, or some of it, actually came from Benjamin Forbes. On one of the afternoons that I was at Ohio Wesleyan, I met with John Batterson's nephew, Dr. Robert Batterson. Although he was only a teenager at the time, Robert was aware that his uncle had written the pamphlet in 1938. The photo of John Batterson was supplied by Paul D., an archivist living in Santa Barbara, California. Paul has done a considerable amount of research on John Batterson. And uh, uh, we can put you in touch with Paul if you'd like additional information on uh, what was going on during this period of time. Paul may Again, be in the room. Wally, Paul may be in the room, so <laughs> I don't know for sure, but uh, I guess we'll know at the end of this. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of the How to Listen to God pamphlet, this is uh, uh, the one that we distribute, uh, which is just uh, uh, one page folded over front and back. It becomes a little four page pamphlet. And uh, probably one of the most important parts uh, that is totally misunderstood by so many within the 12-step community is right. Yep. Writing is the whole thing here. It is, here is the important key to the whole process. Writing down everything that comes to your mind. And I do mean everything. Writing is a simple means of recording so that you can remember later. And since we're talking about writing, Wally, when he does his guidance, he writes, he has his guidance book. I left mine uh, in my home house and uh, should have brought it. But R Wally writes grocery lists. He, it's very systematic, one line for each thing. I, on the other hand, what do I write, Wally? Some of the finest spiritual wording I've ever read. I get guidance as writing a daily meditation or um, even a book, right? I will get pages of it. Wally gets maybe a page or two in the in the grocery list. I get four or five pages in my guidance book each and every day. So how you write it doesn't matter. It's just the fact that you write. We write so that we have something to share with our sharing partners throughout the day and something to review at night. It's uh, pretty difficult to uh, uh, do the nightly review if we haven't written anything in the morning. By the time we do the nightly review, most of us have forgotten a good bit of what God was trying to tell us out of our understanding uh, during the morning quiet time. Now, today, we don't even need to write anymore. We have cell phones. When we're in our morning quiet time, uh, actually uh, five to 10 minutes, some people do 30 minutes. Uh, you talk into the phone and the phone types for you. Then you can uh, hit send and deliver it to your sponsors, sponsees, sharing partners. And yes, now you have something to review at night. Now I have, review. I have one sponsee who is on the East Coast and she writes her guidance out. But in order to share it with me, she will take a picture of it with her phone and send it to me in text. And therefore she's still sharing it with me and we can go over it. And so there are all kinds of ways in this day and age with technology on how to uh, do your guidance or share your guidance with your sharing partners. Yes, we have additional literature. Now we're starting to get into uh, the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, uh, 
Uh, this came from the Dr. Bob and Ann Smith archives. As I mentioned, I am the caretaker of the of their personal archives. Uh, I have 7,000 pages uh, of their archives, all copied, no originals. Uh, but this uh, How to Listen, uh, again, uh, is quite similar to much of what we've already presented to you in terms of how to listen. Quote number one. Everybody longs for a new world. Everybody disagrees about how to get it. There is more knowledge in the world than ever before, yet we are closer to catastrophe. Human wisdom has failed, but God has a plan. Quote how to number listen. One. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Quote number two. God can show you what to do, not in a vague general way, but in a practical way that makes life different and gives you a new direction. How to listen to God, also page one. Quote number three. Some people believe in God. It can work for them. Others do not believe in God, and it can work for them too. Because for all of us, it is an experiment. Quote four. Many people pray, but they do all the talking. A great prophet once said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Most people today, when they pray, say in effect, Lord, or listen, Lord, for your servant is speaking. God gave us two ears and one mouth. So why don't we listen twice as much as we talk? Again. Uh... Compliments of the uh, Akron group in the early 1940s. Now we're going to take a, a, a walk through uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, having to do with step 11. Step 11 reads, Thought through prayer and meditation to approve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Uh, Steve G. Uh, from Clare, Michigan, and myself uh, uh, spent two years putting together 26 references to guidance in the big book. 26 times guidance is mentioned. Uh, again, front and center, very, very important. Uh, I want to start with the definition. Uh, to guide is defined as to lead, direct, influence, or regulate. Two synonyms are to disclose and to show. Again, um, can make this uh, handout available uh, to you, all 26 references. We're just going to read a couple of them. Here is reference number two. I am late. Reference number two, there we go. I'll get there. <laughs> there, I humbly offer myself to the one who has all power to lead and guide me in all of my affairs. I place myself unreservedly under the care and direction of this power. It is page 13, paragraph two, lines one through three, edited. And reference number five. Underneath the material world and life as we see it, there is an all-powerful guiding creative intelligence. Page 49, lines 6 through 8. And reference number 12. In meditation, we ask the God consciousness within what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. Page 69, paragraph 3, lines 6 through 8, edited. Reference number 13. We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. Page 70, paragraph 2, lines 1 through 4. Reference number 19. We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, and that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. Page 87, paragraph one, lines one through four, edited. And reference number 25. 
Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. The one who has all power will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Page 164, paragraph two, lines one through three. Now we're going to uh, move ahead. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, be utilizing the uh, fourth edition of the big book uh, for uh, some concepts that uh, I have incorporated and Britain has also into our seminars in terms of a very, very important concept. Which voice are you listening to? The voice of addiction or the voice of recovery. To tell the difference between these two voices are in steps four, 10, and 11. Our two inventory steps and our prayer and meditation step. Uh, Britt, would you please uh, read the actual quotations? Where had we been selfish, dishonest, resentful, and frightened? Big book, page 67, paragraph two, lines three and four, edited. Step 10, step, 10th step test, I'll get there. <laughs> Continue to watch for selfishness, on dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Big book, page 84, paragraph two, lines eight and nine, edited. And the 11th step test, where were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? The big book, page 86, paragraph one, lines two and three edited. Yes, a very, very important concept. Uh, uh, in terms of the pioneers, uh, they would utilize this test uh, to separate self-will from God's will, uh, to separate liabilities from assets, the uh, four-step inventory described on page 64 of the big book, not the columns on page 65, uh, they weren't even used until the 1970s, uh, no, because nobody knew how to do them. But uh, uh, the assets and liabilities checklist uh, came directly from the Oxford Group. And as I mentioned, many of the pioneers were members of the Oxford Group. There's actually a uh, four-step inventory assets and liabilities checklist that James did in 1935, which is included as one of his uh, day's guidance. Wow. Let's start with the passages from the big book on awakening. On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask the one who has all power to direct our thinking, especially asking it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Big book, page 86, paragraph two, lines one through five, edited. Now let's look at page 87, lines one through nine. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely upon it. Big book, page 87, lines one through nine. Now let's look at page 86, paragraph three, lines one through six. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here, we ask for inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. Next, we are given directions on what to do throughout the day. Throughout the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. We can constantly remind ourselves that we are no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, your will be done. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up, 
up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. It works. It really does. Page 87, paragraph three, lines one through three, and page 88, lines one through seven, paragraph one, line one, edited. And finally, we look at what we do when we retire. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Where were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking of what we could do for others, of what we could pack into this stream of life? Page 86, paragraph one, lines one through nine, edited. Now, for anybody who would like to uh, start on this journey of listening to the indwelling spirit, uh, I want to assure everyone uh, that's attending today that somewhere along the line, you will receive guidance that'll either save your life or put you in a position to save somebody else's life. It's happened to me on numerous occasions. Uh, the one that uh, is most important to me is in terms of the guidance that saved my life uh, took place in Phoenix, Arizona on Monday, June 23rd, 2003. Uh, James H. and I had just finished a Back to Basics seminar in Detroit, Michigan, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday afternoon, uh, we got James to the airport and uh, he got on his plane uh, flying to Baltimore. Uh, then I went down to uh, my gate uh, for a plane that was going to Phoenix and then to Tucson. Uh, that plane sat on the tarmac for two hours. And by the time I got to Phoenix, the Phoenix to Tucson plane had already taken off. So American Airlines uh, put me up at the Hilton Hotel, Park Hilton Hotel uh, at the uh, Phoenix airport. And they don't do that anymore. Uh, no. For the last 10 years, I've been just sleeping on the floor. That's not, not true. You've at least been sleeping in a chair. I know because I've been with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if, if it works, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sleeping in my car as we travel? Yes, now that I do on a regular basis. Um, but I was walking in the Hilton Hotel parking lot uh, at two o'clock in the morning, and I heard what I call the big voice capital B voice, and the voice said, do not let the doctors poison you. You were poisoned in Vietnam. Seek non-toxic treatment for the damage caused by Agent Orange. In Detroit, I'd already announced uh, to the 250, 300 people in the room uh, that this was my last Back to Basics seminar because I did have Agent Orange cancer uh, stage four, they found it through exploratory surgery, so it's not a fluke. And uh, this was going to be my my farewell address to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, these sessions were recorded. Uh, I'm not sure who has the recordings, but uh, uh, I'm on there saying goodbye to the fellowship. And James came on after me, and before he started his lead, uh, he said, uh, even though Wally may not be able to continue uh, with this life-saving work, I am going to continue in its place. The guy is 94, 95 years old at the time, and he's going to continue to do the work uh, as I uh, succumb to uh, Agent Orange cancer from Vietnam. Again, this is the guidance that saved my life. Non-toxic treatment for the damage caused by Agent Orange. Uh, I turned down the chemo. That was a, a, a real uh, uh, opportunity to trust the guidance. Uh, the oncologist at the VA uh, said, uh, uh, 
if you're turning down the chemo, uh, we don't even need to see you anymore. So just go home and enjoy the last few weeks, maybe a couple months of your life. And when you're ready, come see us because we have a bed waiting for you in hospice. So at least they uh, gave me that option. You were poisoned in Vietnam. What does that mean? Uh, sharing this with sharing partners. Uh, every one of them said, we'll go down to the VA and see if they're willing to fess up. Well, they weren't willing to fess up until 2002. This is now 2003. Uh, it was a one page uh, Agent Orange uh, survey, which I filled out in just a few minutes and submitted it. And two months later, I'm going to declare a 100% Vietnam War veteran because of Agent Orange. The very sad part of that is 95% of the vets from Vietnam had to die before uh, the VA started granting benefits for Agent Orange poisoning. Uh, do not let the doctors poison you. I turned down the chemo. And uh, I did get uh, free. Uh, doctors. Uh, uh, one was the VA, the second one was the University of Arizona, the third one was uh, Arizona Oncology, and they pretty much said the same thing, that uh, um, six months to a year to live. But again, uh, by not letting the doctors poison me, and this is just for me, this is my guidance, not saying this for anybody else, attending today, uh, but I did turn down the chemo. Uh, I was placed on over a hundred prayer lists and my Asian orange cancer. As I said, they found it through exploratory surgery. They found me by opening me up. They found it by opening me up and uh, it infected the lymph nodes uh, surrounding my large intestine. Uh, two years, uh, it was being written off as bowel obstructions, but they went in found it wasn't from the inside out all obstructions it was from the outside in so remember this guidance for the rest of my life i actually put it in the front of every one of my guidance books just because i don't want anybody any time to ever forget just how important this life-saving guidance was to me and again i've received a considerable amount of guidance that has continued to save my life or put me in a position to save other people's lives. And I put that in the front of each one of my guidance books so I don't ever uh, have a chance to forget just how important Step 11 is. Now, we want to take uh, a few minutes to talk about the modern version of the How to Listen to God pamphlet. I titled it Listening to the God Consciousness Within, and the pamphlet is listed in the appendices of the book, How, oh, Back to the Basics of Recovery, <laughs> wrong book. It's like, which book, book are you going with here? Wait a minute. You're going to mess me up. We have, we have a yellow book, we have a beige book, and we have a blue book. Uh, and we have a white book. Mixed up sometimes. It's not this book. It's the beige book. Yep. Now, it's, the pamphlet is in the appendices to this book, or we can send it to you if you're interested. I'm just going to read uh, it to you, uh, starting with each morning. Each morning, we practice a quiet time similar to the way Bill Wilson described his quiet time on page 13 of the big book. During this time of prayer and meditation, we discover the most important and practical thing we can ever learn, how to listen to the God consciousness within. All we need is the willingness to try it honestly. Every person who has done this consistently and sincerely has found that it really works. Okay, one, set aside time to meditate. Now go ahead and flip Okay, next one. There you go. At first, we may have difficulty getting quiet and listening, but with more practice, we find that the quiet time more and more effective and productive because it is during this quiet time 
that we find ourselves growing closer and closer to the one that has all power. The quiet time is an essential part of our morning surrender. This is a time when we can make contact with the power greater than ourselves. The power, this power, has a plan for our lives and during our quiet times, much of this plan is revealed to us. The quality of guidance we receive is, direct, is in direct proportion to the amount of time we spend in prayer and meditation. For two, relax and take it easy. We can enhance our spiritual connection by practicing some deep breathing exercises. There are many techniques in use today. They put the mind at rest, shut down the chatter, and alleviate obsessive thoughts and physical cravings. We assume a comfortable position and enter into our quiet time with the expectancy that it will work. We maintain an attitude of reverence and humility. We let our imagination go loose. Images, sounds, feelings, and ideas, and sensations will begin to come into our consciousness. We need to be alert and receptive to all of them. Three, write down or dictate either during or after the period of meditation the guidance you receive so you won't forget it. Have something to discuss throughout the day and review it when you retire. Writing or otherwise recording our images, sounds, feelings, and ideas is the key to this process. We don't try to clear our mind. Rather, we just monitor it. We don't sort out or edit what we receive until our quiet time is over. An image, a sound, a feeling, or an idea comes quickly, and it can escape just as quickly if we do not record it. Be honest and record everything. Number four, test the guidance to determine if it is based in the realm of the material, quote from the big book, which is self-will, or the realm of spirit, also a quote from the big book, which is God's will. We take a good look at what we have recorded. Not every, every image, sound, feeling, or idea we receive comes from a divine source. How do we distinguish between those? that are in the realm of the material and those that are in the realm of the spirit. We test them using the first four items on the four step assets and liabilities checklist. The realm of the material is characterized by resentment, fear, selfishness, and dishonesty. The realm of the spirit is characterized by forgiveness, courage, unselfishness, and honesty. Five, check your guidance with a sharing partner or partners. When the flow of images, sounds, feelings, and ideas slows down, we stop. We take a good look at what we have recorded. Then we discuss our guidance with those who are also regularly practicing two-way prayer. We talk over what we have recorded because more light comes in through two windows than one. And that's actually a quote from the original How to Listen to God pamphlet written in 1938. Six, follow through with the guidance that passes the test of forgiveness, courage, unselfishness, and honesty. We carry out the guidance that appears to us and others to be based on the realm of spirit, but we cannot be completely sure of guidance until we go through with it. A rudder will not guide a boat until the boat is moving. Very often, the results we convince will convince us that we are on the right track. Keep in mind that the God consciousness is then will never guide us to do anything that does not pass the test of forgiveness, courage, unselfishness, and honesty. Now we're going to look at an 11-step guidance meeting format and readings. Uh, the is this, uh, again, one-page handout, uh, four pages, uh, uh, front and back, uh, folded over. And uh, this Meeting format has been put into place uh, hundreds and hundreds of groups throughout the United States and Canada and uh, around the world. We are going right. to look at the format. The format is as follows. Rick, I'd like for you to read the format. Procedure for listening to be read before the meeting. 
During this meeting, we will conduct a five minute meditation in order to make conscious contact and receive guidance from the one who has all power. Guidance can take the form of images, thoughts, feelings, and ideas. We record a brief note about what we see, hear, feel, or realize when we are sitting quietly. We call this two-way prayer. We share the guidance we believe passes the tests of forgiveness, courage, unselfishness, selfishness, and honesty, and guidance we feel comfortable sharing with other members of the group. As we hear others share their guidance, we make a note of anything that is especially meaningful to us. When we receive guidance through another person or persons, we call this three-way prayer. The 11-step guidance meeting format. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are and when you're doing this. My name is, and I welcome you to our 11-step guidance meeting. This meeting is open to anyone and everyone willing everyone seeking a spiritual way of life. Let's open this meeting with a moment of follow, silence followed by the serenity prayer. Optional, to cover meeting expenses, we will now pass the basket. I have asked to read the third paragraph on page 86 of the big book, and I have asked to read today's daily meditation. We will now sit in silence for five minutes in order to listen to and record our guidance. You can use the blank lines on the sheet of paper we handed you when you entered the room to record your images, thoughts, feelings, and ideas you receive. The five minutes of silence. If anyone needs more time, please raise your hand. We will now go through the room. I will ask you to share only what you have written or otherwise recorded without embellishment or explanation. This is called two-way prayer. If you have not recorded anything, please pass. I also ask that you identify yourself by your first name only. The sharing of two-way prayer. Did anyone hear something during the set sharing session that he or she feels was directed toward them in addition to the person sharing it? If so, please tell the group what you heard and what it means to you. This is called three-way prayer. Having the one who has all power communicate with us through others. If this has happened to you, please raise your hand. The sharing of three-way prayer. I would like to thank each of you for participating either by sharing or by listening. I will now read part of the first and second paragraphs on page 87 of the big book. Please remain seated. We will close this meeting with the third and seven step prayers. And on the back of this uh, one pager, uh, we have the uh, passages that are read. Uh, yep. We open with a serenity prayer. Uh, we read the third paragraph on page 86 of the big book. Uh, as part of the close, we read the first and second paragraphs on page 87 of the big book, and we close with the third step and seventh step prayers. Wow. Now, to make it even simpler, uh, this format came to us from Ann Smith. Uh, Dr. Bob's wife, uh, she Hi, <laughs> guidance. She read every guidance meeting in the summer of 1935 uh, at the uh, Smith home when mm -hmm. Bill was visiting. Uh, so she was the teacher. Bill and Bob were the students in terms of this part of the recovery process. Yeah, and I like to think. Um, that Bill Wilson paid homage to her in the big book because she closed every guidance meeting with faith without works is dead. And if you've read the big book, you know that it's in there three times um, in the first 164 pages. So I like to think, like I said, that he was paying homage to her in that respect. So when you uh, walk into the room, you're handed this sheet of paper and a pen. Uh, you have black lines uh, so that you can record your guidance. And then when you turn the page over, you have the readings and additional black lines to record two-way and three-way prayer. So very simple, uh, very straightforward. And it, to me, it's the most powerful meeting format that I've ever experienced. 
It's not an open discussion meeting. It's a guidance meeting. Wow. I will, I will agree with you. It's probably the most powerful uh, meeting format that I have ever taken part of or witnessed. And the first time I saw it, uh, was when James H. was leading the 11-step guidance meeting at the Wilson House in East Dorset, Vermont, in March of 1996. Uh, um, I was just amazed at how uh, powerful that meeting format was. Uh, and this is just as an aside. Uh, I turned the microphone over to James, and I went to the back of the room. Uh, Mitchell K had the Clarence Snyder archives uh, set up in the back of the room. Uh, and I just stood next to him and I said, do you know what's going on? Uh, and Mitchell replied, I don't know, but I bet this is the way Jesus did it. And <laughs> Mitchell's, Mitchell's Jewish. <laughs> was absolutely candy. No, and Mitchell, that's, that's a very funny story. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. Oh. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about three-way prayer, and I mentioned earlier about that proverbial uh, two-by-four hitting you upside the head. So, in the spring of uh, 2018, um, I was here in Tucson. I was uh, doing, doing a commute that I did uh, for a little over two years, about two and a half years, uh, between, Adla between Atlanta, Georgia, and here in Tucson. And because um, I still had taping commitments uh, back on the East Coast. And so I was here in Tucson. Um, I also happened to be a uh, student of Dr. Andrew Weil and uh, the integrative medicine at the University of Arizona Medical College. And there was an upcoming seminar in um, a rheumatology seminar that I really wanted to to attend and it had to do with pain management of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And Wally at the time was suffering from um, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. Um, he neither has diabetes nor, as he said, did he go through the chemo. Uh, two reasons why most people have uh, peripheral neuropathy. And it just came on all of a sudden, but it was to the point where they were, the VA was about to put him in a wheelchair. It was really bad. And every day in my guidance, I kept this, I had this thing going, you're not, um, in my guidance, that you're not going to be able to go to this seminar. You need to ask Wally to take notes for you. And I wasn't doing anything about it. I wasn't asking him to go to this thing and to the seminar for me and take notes. I didn't know at the time that they were gonna record it and then I would be able to view it later. Um, that came after the fact, but I didn't wanna ask him. He's dealing with this neuropathy. We're trying to help, you know, I'm trying to help him through it. I need to go back to the East Coast. And, and it just, everything was just like cat, a catastrophe surrounding this. And every day I would do my guidance and every day I would get this voice saying, you need to ask Wally to take notes at the seminar. And the more I ignored it, the louder the voice became. That's the proverbial two by four. Like it ended up hitting me square between the eyes one day. It was so loud, I couldn't drown it out and I could no longer do nothing about it. I had to ask him. And I said, well, you know, I have to go back east. There is the seminar on rheumatology and pain management. I'm not sure who's giving it, but I would you please go and take notes for me? And I and, took my walker down to the Arizona Medical Center. So he went for me. I went back east. He went and took notes for me. Wally is a great note taker, by the way. Like the man takes immaculate notes on everything. Even if you call him, I guarantee you, he's making notes on your conversation. And <laughs> so I went 
like I said, I went back east. He went to the, the seminar. He's taking the notes. And halfway through the seminar, he gets his answer. The doctor who was giving the presentation, Dr. Randy Horowitz, happens to be uh, a doctor Wally had seen um, when Dr. Andrew Weil retired from seeing patients because he was too famous, um, who is now, um, Dr. A uh, Dr. Horowitz is now uh, the director of the Integrative Medicine Clinic and still seeing patients to this day. He happens to be Wally's doctor. That's one, one guidance point I didn't know, but it, it was his doctor. And his doctor tells him for neuropathy, you need to take alpha lipoic acid. It's a daily supplement. Wally got his answer. This is the three-way prayer. He got the answer he needed. He came home, he got some alpha lipoic acid, he started taking it, it comes in capsules. He started taking it and from that day to this, he doesn't have any neuropathy. It, it completely went away. Now, if he stops taking it, it will come back. He's come tried that. But to keep it at bay and away, he takes that daily supplement and that is the three-way prayer God worked through me because of something I actually needed or thought I needed to get him to a place where he got the answer he needed to take care of his medical situation. Kind of weird how three-way prayer works, but uh, if you don't believe and you see that happen, it, it, it will make you a believer <laughs> real quick. So Wally, thank you for letting me share that story on our three-way prayer. Um, it's happened to us uh, actually a number of times since where I've gotten the guidance and directed you to where you needed to go or what you needed to do. And here we are. So anything hey, you want to add to that, Wally? Now that we've provided you with all this information, why don't you try it? Yep. This sketch is from an Oxford group pamphlet titled, How Do I Begin? I described this pamphlet in detail within chapter 11 of the How to Listen to God book. The pamphlet describes a hypothetical conversation that takes place between a changed person, the sponsor, and a non-believer, the sponsee. The changed person takes the non-believer through the Oxford group four steps and the non-believer has a change of heart and comes to believe. But the key is, why don't we try that? Now we're gonna close this session. Oh, you wanna talk about uh, uh, something else having to do with uh, the guidance meetings? Yep, so while we realize we have not done an actual guidance meeting in this seminar, um, if you would like, uh, for us to come back and lead one for the group, uh, just let us know. Uh, originally, the meeting had eight to 14 participants and lasts for about an hour. Through the years, though, we have conducted this 11-step guidance meeting with several hundred or more participants. So it can be done. It can be done via Zoom. And we would be more than happy to come back and do one for you. So let's go ahead and close this meeting uh, with a third step and seven step prayers. Uh, I've modified these slightly uh, to uh, bring them a little bit up to date. Uh, you can stay muted, but I do yeah. want you to uh, uh, listen and, and follow along the prayers as we lead. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. 
good are the assets, bad are the liabilities for the fourth step. I pray that you now remove from me every single liability that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength to go out from here to do your bidding.